get started. My name is Eric Malak. I'm one of the uh, child neurologists at Weill Cornell, and I'm the director of the Luca Dystrophy Center here. Um, I do some part-time research work with Mass General and Dr. Eichler's group. I'm going to talk today about an ALD newborn screening pilot project and really conceptually about redefining the natural history of adrenal leukodystrophy. So my disclosures, uh, my previous work uh, was funded by an, NI an NINDS K-12 award, which I'm going to talk about some of that. And the pilot award that I'm going to talk about in this talk um, is funded by uh, GLIA CTN, which is a, uh, a partner of the RDCRN uh, from the NIH. So just to frame the talk, the overall aim of this pilot project is really to leverage the opportunity afforded by newborn screening uh, to prospectively study the early natural history of ALD. And we want to do this across sites, both domestic and eventually um, on an international stage. And how are we going to do this? Uh, the plan is to use common data elements obtained during clinical assessments that follow published surveillance guidelines. What this is really gonna come down to is, is designing a data collection tool which can be implemented um, across sites that can extract natural history data for patients who are being prospectively followed um, with adrenal leukodystrophy. So I'll talk a little bit today about uh, the natural history and outcomes. What do we know? Uh, I'll start with adrenal insufficiency and then I'll talk about cerebral ALD and then I'll go into a bit of the detail um, on the natural history pilot. So adrenal insufficiency, um, it's the A in adrenal leukodystrophy. This is work done by um, the Amsterdam group and the Mass General group looking at, well, how many people develop adrenal insufficiency and when do they develop it over the course of a lifetime? So if I can draw your attention to this blue line here, um, for those who aren't familiar, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve, 100% of the patients here, 0% here, time to event. So this is birth to 80 years old. And uh, their data suggests that essentially by the age of 10, about half of the patients will have developed adrenal insufficiency. And in identifying those patients uh, during newborn screening is extraordinarily important because as the physicians in the, in the, in the crowd know, um, adrenal crises uh, come with high morbidity and can actually be fatal. So there is a talented uh, group of endocrinologists who uh, came together put together surveillance guidelines, which has been published. Um, this, this was led by uh, Dr. Regelman, who's here in New York City. Uh, this is their complicated algorithm, but just to walk you through it really quickly, um, patients who are identified, especially males, with ALD at birth, so here less than two years of age, go through a screening protocol where they look at ACTH and cortisol levels, and then depending on your ACTH level and then your subsequent cortisol level, uh, match the level of intervention that they need in terms of uh, glucocorticoid replacement. So I'm going to talk, transition now to cerebral ALD and sort of what do we know about the natural history, especially in the area of newborn screening. So again, this is uh, from, the, from the same paper looking at phenotype um, in ALD. And I'll draw your uh, attention to the red line here. Again, 100%, 0%. Where we get the 30% number of childhood cerebral ALD is by about the age of 10, we see that about 30% will have developed cerebral disease, whereas 70% will have not. And what we know is in the era of newborn screening, we identify patients with um, ABCD1 mutation. And as you'll recall, Boys identified by newborn screening with ALD will undergo surveillance for cerebral ALD, but 60 to 70% of them actually do not develop childhood cerebral ALD. They go on to develop um, the, adult, the adult neurophenotype called AMN. But as we saw in the last slide, you know, about 30 to 40% of the patients somewhere under the age of 12 with the max incidence between three and 12 years old will develop a cerebral, a cerebral lesion. We've done some research over the past year or so and found that there's a small sub-portion of these patients whose lesions develop. They don't uh, develop contrast enhancement. That is, uh, they don't undergo inflammation. And these patients 
their cerebral disease spontaneously erupts. But the vast majority will have contrast enhancement on their MRI, indicating that they have inflammation. And they go on to have the progressive cerebral ailment. This is a little bit of a complicated slide, but this is work done by uh, the Minnesota group, um, looking at what do untreated patients look like with uh, cerebral ALD. So if I look, if you look at the top uh, graph here, um, these are untreated patients. The dark line is overall survival. The light gray line is uh, major function, functional disability free survival, meaning how long do you remain without a uh, major neurologic symptom? And untreated, you can see by about five years out. Unfortunately, untreated with the disease is, uh, is quite fatal, and more than half of the patients develop um, severe neurological. So a question came up. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the presentation and then I'm going to try to answer if I have some time. Any questions? Um, but thank you, Sue. So. If you look at the bottom part of this uh, <clears throat> of this slide here, patients who develop cerebral inflammation essentially get sicker faster and uh, mortality is higher. So uh, overall untreated morbidity and mortality is high. We know this in cerebral ALD and those with cerebral inflammation get essentially sicker faster. And these are the major functional disabilities over time that we're up against. Um, patients lose ability to communicate, become cortically blind, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the, that is the natural history of um, untreated cerebral ALD in retrospect when we look back at um, historical records. So if we take this curve, we know that if we intervene and treat patients with um, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, we can move this survivor curve upwards. Patients will survive um, and this is an advanced disease cohort. So these are patients who are symptomatic or have a less score um, greater than nine or 10. But unfortunately, they still become quite sick. So they, uh, patients will often accumulate major neurologic um, symptoms. But what if we intervened much earlier in the pre-symptomatic time period um, uh, in patients who have an MRI with a less score less than nine considered um, earlier? We can move this bottom curve here indicating that patients accumulate symptoms and essentially demonstrate that over time, patients not only survive, but remain um, relatively asymptomatic if you intervene early. So the outcomes are clearly superior when we diagnose disease and intervene early, but so the question then becomes, well, what are the signs of early stage cerebral ALD? And every time I give a talk, I bring up the slide because I think um, it's uh, just of the utmost importance uh, boys who are identified and have cerebral ALD with an MRI score less than or equal to four, which is very early stage disease, a significant portion of these boys will have some uh, severe deficit uh, in some neurocognitive domain. And then this is a split over four, <clears throat> excuse me, over a less score of 4.5, a larger proportion will have neurocognitive deficit. Uh, indicating that um, neurocognitive changes are quite early indicators of patients with cerebral ALD. Uh, this is work that we've done um, just demonstrating what early cerebral ALD lesions look like. Um, as you can see here, this is the corpus callosum. So we're looking at tiny um, P2 hyperintense white matter changes. So in the era of newborn screening, when we're screening these boys by MRI, these are the types of changes that we're looking for. Again, very subtle T2 changes in MRI, which grow uh, at least what we think initially slowly over time and then ramp up in terms of speed. Um, these are just more images of the brain. Looking at the mid-sagittal view, you're looking for tiny uh, T2 changes here, you can see it here. And then in this column all the way here on the right, this is the type of regional enhancement that we're looking for to indicate that the patient has inflammatory disease. And these are the patients that we seek to transplant in the new era of gene therapy. So that is understanding the disease in retrospect. But now that we have newborn screening, we're going to make use of this opportunity and ask what are the common data elements that we should be collecting over time in these boys who are identified asymptomatically so that we can understand what the natural history of disease looks like while we're ahead of the game. So 
And this number may need to be updated. Uh, I think uh, Lisa Seeger is giving a talk later today or tomorrow, and she'll give an update on newborn screening. But we're about we're at about half of the babies in the U.S. being sc uh, screened for ALD. Um, I'm here in New York City at Wild Cornell, New York Presbyterian, and I see some of these patients. New York should detect about 10 to 15 patients per year. And what we're going to do, like I said, is leverage this opportunity to prospectively study the natural history of early ALD. So the aims of the project, aim one really is to develop a minimal data set that captures the prospective natural history. So again, thinking about what are the data elements that need to be um, extracted from uh, the natural history of these patients so that we can um, essentially rebuild these natural history graphs. So this is a really busy slide um, and it's hard to see, but I'm gonna zoom in in a moment. But this is to give you a bird's eye view. Each one of these blocks is year of life. So year of life one, two, three, four. Uh, the gray is um, an initial assessment once a patient's uh, identified by newborn screening. All of these peach blocks that you see are the proposed uh, frequency of assessments with a pediatric endocrinologist. So you actually see in the first year, the person you probably should be seeing most um, is your pediatric endocrinologist. And then the blue here are the proposed MRI monitoring schedule. Um, for when we should be obtaining. So if I, if I um, zoom in here on year one, um, patients taken in, these are some of the variables that at least I'm propo I proposed in the project to start to collect over time um, using, this, uh, using this data collection tool. So the idea is to first design it and then um, the next step would to be validate, would be to validate the tool. So design the tool, think about what the data elements that are needed to go in, test it on our patient population, of course, be identified, and then pass the validation tool onto the next site in one of the, uh, one of the institutions within the GLEA network um, to try it out on their patients and to see if we can come up and say, hey, is this data, is this data extraction tool usable across institutions and across people extracting data? Does it, do we do an accurate job? There's a way to calculate um, how well you can do that. Um, and then you make adjustments and then send it to essentially to the next institution. And in doing this iterative process, we should theoretically come up with a data extraction tool that can be used anywhere by anyone. And then once validated, the idea is to then um, deploy it across all institutions that follow patients early. And the nice part about using something like RedCap, which is, uh, is, which is one of the data collection tools that we use, is it populates a centralized database and then from which we can apply our, we can apply our statistical analysis. So really, why is this important? So um, what we can do is once we, allow, once we follow these patients for the next four, five, six, seven years, we can start understanding when patients really develop cerebral ALD. When do patients really start developing um, adrenal symptoms? What's the best treatments? Can we risk assess uh, patients earlier in life to maximize our treatment? So the clinical implications are, um, like I said, gives us insight into patients at risk um, for, the, for disease progression. And I think this one's really important. We know at least in cerebral ALD and, and adrenal insufficiency, insufficiency, there is this pre-symptomatic window. Boys are born, they have um, the biochemical signature of, of ALD, so elevated uh, very long chain fatty acids. But we follow them for a couple of years before they develop symptoms. Traditionally, as I showed you uh, a couple of slides ago, um, severity of disease can be can be quite high, and if diagnosis is delayed, um, treatment outcomes um, are not often. So identifying patients earlier, like I said, can widen this pre-symptomatic window, and that allows for uh, lead time to drop in preventative strategies. And to do so, um, we need to quantify what that time looks like. Um, you quantify the time, you can then build upon uh, those time intervals clinical trials to show effectiveness. And so this is how I think about um, cerebral ALD. We want to intervene as early as possible and push patients so that they're, 
disease arrests and arrests early so that they remain um, alive and they remain free of major functional disability. And of course, I, I think the, you know, the pie in the sky is once we start extracting uh, data points and, and start to understand what the disease looks like as it's emerging, instituting preventative strategies and perhaps one day uh, taking cerebral ALD off the map. So um, I've been really fortunate and I always put this slide up, these are pre-COVID times, but I've been really fortunate to have been supported by um, Dr. Eichler and his lab, and all of his research uh, coordinators. And we have a growing family at, um, at Weill Cornell where we're building out our leukodystrophy program um, in conjunction with um, uh, Memorial Sloan Cancer Center where we're, we're treating patients with bone marrow transplant and hopefully soon to therapy. So I want to say thank you. And I can take questions. So I received a, a, a comment from Ms. Valentin um, from Puerto Rico, member of the Council of Inherited Diseases in the Health Department, project to start ALD testing newborn screening in 2021. Um, we intend to have our, our tool um, validated um, in the next four to six months, and we'd love to think about collaboration. So there, uh, there's a question here from Dr. Bonkowski. Are patients enrolled with consent at the start of the study? Just thinking uh, about an idea. Um, Josh, we can talk about, about this uh, more. Um, we do have a, an IRB at Cornell, um, which requires uh, consent because patients are prospectively enrolled. Um, but if you bring up your specific idea, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, there's a question from uh, Carrie Denials. Thank you. What can we do? Um, I think that what can we do as newborn screening parents regarding this? That's a, a, a wonderful question. I think the, the number one thing that comes up um, in, in, in in treating patients and especially the newborn screening patients is really the, the parent and physician partnership. Um, it's a lot of work for families who are identified by newborn screening to see a pediatrician, see an endocrinologist, see a neurologist, and then be put on these relatively arduous um, surveillance schedules. So I think as newborn screening parents, um, I think there's a lot of value in um, and communicating well with your physicians, coming up with a plan that works for everybody and really, really taking an honest team approach to this. And also spreading word about the pilot. That would be great as well. Um, message from Keith Van Heeren, great talk, Eric. What about adding vitamin D levels to your data profiles? Absolutely. So we have not, um, I, have a, I have an idea about most of the variables that will go into the data collection tool, um, but I encourage uh, all major sites and collaborators to please reach out to me. I want this to be a community level decision about what we think needs to be in here, because at the end of the day, it's hopefully going to be something that we all use. So I look forward to talking to you about that. There's a question from Artemio Ortega. Do men with arrested childhood cerebral ALD develop AMN in the future? Uh, I think so. Uh, I, uh, the, the data suggests that um, AMN is a sort of separate pathophysiologic, uh, happens by a separate pathophysiologic mechanism. It is uh, spinal cord neurodegeneration, 
versus something like childhood cerebral ALD, which is um, a demyelinating event plus or minus inflammation. Um, unfortunately, um, development of AMN in boys, I think is a, a when, not an if question. Some, some patients develop it in late teens, early 20s, and some patients develop it um, later in life and to varying degrees. Uh, the term for this in genetics is uh, variable expressivity. So, um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, variable penetrance. So some patients are quite effective and some are not for reasons we don't understand. Okay, I have time for maybe one more question here. Going back to the earlier presentation on endocrine aspects of endothelial permeability with early identification of um, AI normalization of ACTH help prevent CCALD in theory. Um, I think if I'm understanding this question correctly, uh, it's do we, if we can normalize ACTH, um, can we help prevent childhood cerebral ALD? There have been preventive trials notably um, uh, the Lorenzo's oil trial that helps, that tries to, that tried to stabilize very long chain fatty acid uh, levels. That secondarily leads to um, elevations. Um, uh, excuse me. Um, the Lorenzo's oil trial tried to stabilize very long chain fatty acid levels, but did not seem to prevent the onset of cerebral ALP. As for ACTH and the onset of adrenal insufficiency, um, I do not know. I think that would be a question for the for the endocrinologist. Would it help prevent CCALD in theory? It's also a good question. Um, I do not know the answer to that. There are some very good newborn screening questions in here, um, which actually questions like what barriers what barriers exist currently that cause ALD newborn screen to not be mandated nationwide. That is a question for, that's from Eric Hiller. That is a question for um, Elisa Seeger. She has lots of experience. And I, I believe during her talk, she will address a lot of these. Okay, I think my time is up. Um, we're gonna allow some time to transition to Dr. Kemp's talk. Um, so thank you for the time. And as more questions come in and are filtered through ALD Connect, I'll be happy.